بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الحمد لله حمدا يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم So the last class we spoke about um, two things uh, The first of those things we spoke about you know um, the compilation of hadith at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu himself and then we also discussed the compilation of hadith uh, at a governmental level where it occurred in the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz where he you know, sent a letter out to people of different countries and asked them all to collect the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we discussed that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz he sent a letter to Abu Bakr ibn Hazm and he told him particularly to speak to Amrah and he also speak to Al Qasim and also he encouraged Imam Al Zuhri rahmatullah alayhi thereafter a number of people after Imam Al Zuhri had put his collection together a number of people also started to participate in the process of the compilation so for example amongst them was Imam Malik rahmatullah alayhi in Medina amongst them was Ibn Ishaq Amongst them was Ibn Juraj, and all of these people, Ibn Juraj and Ibn Ishaq, were in Mecca. And Hamad ibn Salama were amongst who he was amongst the people as well that you know that participated in this. Abdullah ibn Mubarak al Awza'i, and the names go on and on and on. A lot of people con- contributed uh, after Imam al Zuhri uh, bro- uh, broke the ice. Thereafter, a lot of people contributed to Hadith. However, there was one thing missing. In all of these collections, and the thing that was missing in all of these collections was the fact that none of them collected only Sahih Hadith. All of them collected Hadith, you know, that included Da'if a Hadith, that included, you know, a Fatawa of the Tabi'een, that included Athar of Sahaba. All of these things were mentioned in the books that were done previously. The first book that was collected. Um, that was compiled of only Sahih Ahadith was yet to be found. Was yet to be found. Then came, you know, a time where the need began. So a person by the name of Ishaq, Ishaq ibn Rahawai, Ishaq ibn Rahawai, and some of the ulama they pronounce his name Ishaq. Ibn Rahuyah. Rahuyah. And this is, you know, pronunciation differs, you know, based on the uh, the different ulama. Some of them say that, you know, it's, you pronounce it Ishaq ibn Rahuyah and not Rahawai because of the fact that the word way uh, is said to be a name from amongst the names of Shaytan. And this is found in a tradition, though the tradition is weak, you know. Which says, Way ism shaytan. Just like that. Way is a name of shaytan. But because of the fact that this concept of way being the name of shaytan, it became extremely popular. All the names that ended, it's a Persian name, all the names that ended with the word way, the ulama of hadith, they changed it around to uh, having the letter right before it becoming madmum. So they would say, Niftuyah, Saybuyah, Rahuyah. Though the name was Saybuyah. Nift away, uh, away, because they didn't want to have a portion that was known by people to be the name of Shaytan. Though in and of itself, the hadith is not sahih. And the fact that the ulama did this, that they changed the name around a bit, just so it doesn't have this uh, implication in there, doesn't mean the tradition was correct. The tradition is still life. It's still not an authentic narration that says, way is ism of Shaytan. But this is just a side note. Ishaq ibn Rahawi was the teacher of who? He was the teacher of a number of scholars. I see all the pens rolling as soon as I said who. <laughs> so Ishaq ibn Rahawi, he you know, had a group of students, and as he's teaching, and this is something a teacher is supposed to do. When you're teaching, you encourage your students to do good. And you encourage your students to do things that you might have in the back of your head, but you think maybe your life is too short for you to accomplish it. 
So Ishaq ibn Rahawi, he said to his students, لَوْ جَمَعْتُمْ كِتَابًا مُخْتَصَرًا لِصَحِيحِ سُنَّةِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. It would be very nice if you were to put together a book that would only have the authentic narrations from amongst the narrations of the Prophet ﷺ. So all of these students, you know, that are there, all muhaddithin, one from amongst them decided that I am going to be the one that will take up this task. I'm going to be the one that take take up this task. Now Ishaq ibn Rahway said one word, and inshallah ta'ala for the rest of it, inter, eternity, or for the rest of time, so long as, you know, ilm is around, Bukhari's book will be of benefit to him. Because it was Imam al-Bukhari rahmatullah alayhi, that got up and he said that I will be the one to write this book. So Imam Bukhari said that, you know, the statement of my teacher, فَوَقَعَ ذَلِكَ فِي قَلْبِ So the statement of my teacher, it really affected my heart. فَأَخَذْتُ فِي جَمْعِ الْجَامِعَ الصَّحِيحِ So I started to put together الْجَامِعَ الصَّحِيحِ This book by the name of الْجَامِعَ الصَّحِيحِ Now what's interesting is that the name of the book is Al Jami' al Sahih Al Musnad Al Muhtasar Fi Sahih Fi Min Hadithi Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's the name of the book. Al Jami' al Sahih Al Musnad Al Muhtasar Min Hadithi Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, for centuries people have forgotten the real name of the book. Everybody knows the book as Sahih Al Bukhari. And this shows, and shows something very beautiful, that being the fact that if a person corrects his intention in an action that he does, if a person corrects his intention in an action that he does, you will find that the benefit of that will go on for a long time. So long as the intention is correct. Imam al-Bukhari wrote a book, one book. And for the rest of time it became, for the rest of, you know, uh, the Ummah of Muhammad, it became the reference point for hadith. Or amongst the main reference, reference points for hadith. And such is the case with a number of books. Look for example, at Mawta Imam Malik. Mawta Imam Malik, at that point, people said to Imam Malik, why are you writing this Mawta? You know, who do you think you are, basically? You know, there's other people that are stronger than you in knowledge, and they've written muattas. Why is it that you have to come and write this muatta as well? <coughs> so, so Imam Malik, he replied back with a statement that should be written in gold. He said that later on, and only in the future, will you know which one of these muattas were written for the sake of Allah Azza. And today we don't have one muatta from that time except the muatta of Imam Malik. Because he'd written it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure alone. Seeking nothing but that. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ This hadith, you know, we've heard it so many times, but it doesn't affect our heart. Imam al-Shafi'i, rahmatullah alayhi, he said that this hadith enters into more than 70 different chapters of fiqh. Because every single thing you do has to have an intention involved. And it's only because of that intention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises some in status and decreases the status of others. And here is a prime example, Imam, Imam al-Bukhari, rahmatullah alayhi, writing a book that wasn't even named by his own name, but the name of the book becoming changed. And there's another other examples, like for example, if you look at, you know, Ulum al-Hadith, written by, uh, written by, uh, Ibn Salah rahmatullah alayhi. Nowadays, most people know the book as Muqaddimat Ibn Salah. And some books, they're, you know, they're there, and nobody even knows the author of it. And some books, you know, they don't even last anyways. And so this was the first and very first book that was written entirely sahih. Entirely Sahih. And that's why Imam Suyuti, he says, وَأَوَّلُ الْجَامِعِ بِاقْتِصَارِ عَلَى الصَّحِيحِ فَقَطِ الْبُخَارِ And the first of the books or collections that were entirely authentic was only 
the book of Imam al-Bukhari. Thereafter came a number of other texts, like the book of Imam Muslim himself, who was a student of Imam al-Bukhari. Imam Muslim was a student of Imam al-Bukhari. Uh, so then he wrote his book called Sahih Muslim. And then, you know, people started to write a number of other books, like for example, Sahih Ibn Khuzayma, uh, you know, um, Mustadrak, which was uh, deemed by the author to be correct, though there's uh, Da'ifa Hadith in there as well. But the point of the matter is, a number of people started to now take up this methodology of writing books that will only be Sahih. Or, for the most part, they'll only be Sahih. And when we say for the most part, we can now include Sunan al Nasa'i, Sunan Abi Dawood, and all of these other four Sunan. A question arises. Which book is more authentic? Bukhari or Muslim? Bukhari. Muslim. Who said Muslim? Raise your hand. You seem like you're Maliki or something. No, no. Muslim is, uh, he, like he has made it more easier. Yeah. yeah. So Muslim has probably gone to a generation where they have proved that the two Rabis have met in life in, at one point or the other. Okay. Taib. Now, this is, you know, something that was discussed by the ulama in the past uh, rigorously. And some of the ulama from amongst the Malikiya, they said that uh, they said that that Mus- Imam Muslim Sahih is the stronger one. Imam Muslim Sahih is the stronger one, according to some of the ulama. However, according to the you know the ulama, and according to the right opinion in the issue, Imam. Bukhari Sahih is a stronger one in terms of authenticity. And that's why a person said, uh, a poet said, Tashajara qawmun fil Bukhari wa muslimu ilayya faqalu ayyu dhaynin tuqaddimu faqultu laqad faqa al-Bukhari yu sahatan kama faqa fi husna al-sana'ati muslimu. To a people begin to argue about Bukhari and Muslim. Ilayya faqalu ayyu dhaynin tuqaddimu. They came to me and they said, which one of these two would you give precedence to? <coughs> so I said, that Bukhari, in terms of its authenticity, it's the one that was the winner. However, in terms, as the brother said, in terms of the organization of the book, it's Imam Muslim's book that's better. In terms of the organization of the book, it's Imam Muslim's book that's better. But however, both books have their ups and downs. You know, it's not a book, it's not the book of Allah Azza wa so it's not going to be perfect from every single angle. So for example, Imam al-Bukhari rahmatullah alayhi, he writes his own chapter titles, which shows the way or the concepts that Imam, Imam al-Bukhari he himself believed in, and what he uh, understood from the hadith. So he takes the ruling that he derived and he understood from the hadith, and he'll put it in a chapter title. Imam Muslim doesn't have chapter titles. So if you find chapter titles today in Imam Muslim's book, know that this is not the chapter titles that Imam Muslim put in. These are chapter titles that were put in later on by different ulama, amongst them is Imam al nawi And those are the most common chapter titles, the ones that are written by who? That are written by an Imam al nawi rahmatullah alayhi. And, um, you know, this is in terms of the authenticity of each. Now if you were to look at hadith in general as a whole, which book is more authentic and which is less authentic? The ulama they say, whenever, which hadith is more authentic and which is not? The ulama they say, whenever Bukhari and Muslim agree upon a hadith, this is the highest level of hadith. So there are seven levels and I'll mention each one of them. Okay? Number one, whenever Bukhari and Muslim agree upon a hadith. <coughs> Number two, because you know, they're the most authentic books and they both agreed upon the fact that the hadith is sahih. So they both have and contain the hadith, that means it's the most authentic. Bukhari and Muslim together. Then Bukhari by himself, number two. Bukhari by himself. So Bukhari's hadith are more authentic because of the fact that Imam al-Bukhari didn't use to accept a hadith to be sahih 
until he knew that every narrator had actually physically met the one that he's narrating from. Whereas Imam, Muslim, he would accept the hadith so long as he knew they both lived at the same time and it's possible for them to meet. You get it? But Imam al-Bukhari would say, no, so long as they, we don't know if they've met, we don't have knowledge of the fact that they've met, he wouldn't consider this hadith da'if, but at least he would say, I'm not going to put it in this book of mine. Because Imam al-Bukhari had a lot of hadith, sahih, in his mind that he didn't put in the book. He only picked the cream of the crop and put it in this book. And such was the case with Imam Muslim. However, in this one condition, Imam al-Bukhari sahih was stronger than Imam Muslim sahih. So, this is why Imam al-Bukhari has the precedence. So number two, Imam al-Bukhari by himself. <coughs> number three, Imam Muslim by himself. Number four, any hadith that's on the, condi- uh, that's on the condition of Imam Al-Bukhari's Sahih. Uh, any hadith that's on the conditions of Imam Al-Bukhari and Muslim together. Muttafaq Ali. It's not Muttafaq Ali, it's not agreed upon, but it has the same values. And all of the conditions that both ulama have set are found in this hadith. So that's number four. Number five, any hadith that's on the condition of Imam al-Bukhari. Number six, any hadith that's on the condition of Imam Muslim. And number seven, any hadith that is on the conditions of other ulama that also authenticate hadith. Any hadith that's on the condition of you know the other books, Sunan Abi Dawood and Nasa'i, and so on and so forth. So they're all categorized in one category. And with that being said, we'll stop for the day. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين